this bill we're considering today, this section is part of uh, an agenda that represents uh, the latest attack in the war on work. And if you don't believe this is a war on work, look at the jobs figures. We saw a jobs report come out last week. They're far short of the Democrats' own projections of what they should, of the jobs that should have been created coming out of this pandemic. If you don't believe it's a war on work, talk to every business owner in my district who cannot fill their open positions. Yet while this is happening, Democrats are still ramming through this trillions of dollars tax and spend agenda that will continue to kill jobs and is ushering in a new era of government dependency. Coming out of this pandemic, more government checks, higher taxes are the last things that American families and our local business needs. And by the way, this, you look at this, that's the part of this bill we've received so far just in the last few days. As has been mentioned before, no one's read this, but this isn't the whole bill. Guess what's not in here yet? How this will be paid for. We don't even know yet how this bill will be paid for. We think it's going to be every American worker having dollars taken out of their paycheck to pay for this. But we don't even know that yet. This is a what we're seeing created today is a brand new entitlement program that will make these problems worse for small businesses. And we do know in this bill that this program has very limited connection to work. In fact, one does not have to be working to receive the benefits of this program. I'll say that again. You don't even have to be working to receive the benefits of this program. It says it right on page 16. If the individual does not have or no longer has an employer. If we're going to do this program, my colleagues across the aisle, at least connect it to work. That's what my amendment would, that's what my amendment would do. This amendment would strengthen the program's connection to work by requiring that the individual applying for benefits must have wages or self-employment income in the 30-day period prior to applying for the benefits, or must have been employed at least, and must have been employed at least four of the five most recent calendar quarters. We, by the way, looked at state paid leaves. There are a few states that have paid leave bills in place. Every single one of those states that have a paid leave program were reasonable enough to implement policies that at least require workers to be employed 30 days prior. That includes California, it includes Massachusetts and New York. Mr. Chairman, I do have a CRS report for the record that I'd like to submit for the record. So ordered. This report includes a comparison of those states of all selected state leave program characteristics and includes the earning requirements in each of those states. This bill has no such similar provision, and I'm asking my colleagues across the aisle to be reasonable, use common sense, to put in place a policy adopted by every state that, that already uses paid, that already runs paid leave to strengthen the connection to work. Permanent new welfare without work entitlement programs foster greater dependence on gover government and reduces the focus on work and on personal responsibility. My concern is that this program will ultimately be just another cash benefits program completely disconnected from the worker. I urge my colleagues to vote for this common sense amendment. And with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman has withdrawn the point of order. And the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Yeah, it's interesting the arguments that we hear against legislation such as this, because every time we propose something that really helps working families, we get the sky is falling argument that it's going to completely blow up our economy and that, you know, it's it's going to ruin uh, small businesses, that people are going to take advantage of it. And I just want to point out that there are several states that already have paid family leave enacted into law. One of those states is the state of California. It's where I come from. And our economy is doing pretty well. 
Every time we hear these doom and gloom arguments, they make it sound like there's no way it can possibly work. And yet, California's economy is so strong that if it were its own independent country, it'd be the fifth largest economy in the world. And you ask employers in California, it hasn't blown the economy up. In fact, it's made it stronger. It's helped workers stay in the workforce. The bill before us requires a strong recent work history. So it is tied to work. And we don't wanna delay the benefits to folks who need it in emergency situations. It would just inflate the administrative cost of the program and it would exclude some people in very bad situations. So I don't think that this amendment is well thought out. I think it is an amendment in search of a problem that doesn't exist. And again, I would point to very clear examples in other states where family medical leave is implemented and where the economy is doing just fine. So these doom and gloom, sky is falling economic arguments they don't really match reality. And with that, I would urge my colleagues to vote no on this amendment, and I yield back to the chair. Thank you. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer, is recognized on the amendment. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask how this possibly makes things works for small business. Small business now has to pay for any kind of family leave that, that their employees need. Now they can't compete with bigger businesses that can afford it. Then, if this passes, they'll have much better retention of their people. And as anyone in business knows, the only thing we have to sell are our people. So why aren't we trying to take care of them? And do we really think the current labor shortage is permanent? Or is this just a casualty of the COVID crisis when many people took the opportunity to rethink their lives and their careers and maybe choose not to go back to that $7.20 an hour job? Or could this shortage give us some insight in the need for a much more generous and aggressive immigration policy. American birth rate, 1.64 children per woman, way below the 2.1 needed for a replacement fertility rate. Women are having children later in life, which means we're, we're increasing the length of a generation. The median age in America has risen from 29 in 1960 to 38 in 2018 and continues to go up, older and older and older. By 2035, there will be more adults over 65 than children in the United States. If we don't want to go the way of Italy and Japan, we need strong pro-family policies. And this bill does more to advance family than anything in American history. And that includes small business. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to uh, speak briefly. Uh, my colleague just uh, mentioned, sort of referenced the uh, labor shortage that exists. Uh, America is a big country. Few things are similar across America, but right now there is a labor shortage that is killing off jobs as there are restaurants that can't open because they can't find the employees they need. There, I would argue, are child care centers that can't function as they would like because of the labor shortage. And what are we doing here today? Making it worse. Let's not make it worse. Let's work together to find ways to bring folks back into the workforce, bring them off the sidelines in a way that can provide a much brighter future, not just for individuals themselves, but communities and states. Uh, my colleague from California says that everything's great in California. I would argue differently, just speaking on the numbers, the census numbers uh, themselves, as folks uh, are choosing to move out of the state of California, and uh, I, I just think we can do much better than this legislation today. Uh, as my colleague from Missouri mentioned, there are other far more important issues that ought not be dismissed as we debate these, these items right now. And uh, the American people would like us to address those. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. The chair is prepared to call the question. And the question oh, is... Mr. Not, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I may. You may. Mr. Brady's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I too am excited how strong California's economy is because it's it's all moving to Texas. And we appreciate the jobs and the uh, business that comes with it. Um, the truth is, this is the desire to get uh, to create know? access to. Now at this time, the desire to create access to paid family medical leave has been a bipartisan uh, area. 
the question is, how do we do it and how do we help women? So do we do it with the incentives? We know about half of full-time workers have access. How do we do more? The Republican approach has been the first family paid medical leave tax credit, now in the tax code today, that helps businesses afford this and other incentives to help those small businesses and others who don't yet have that program. We think that is a smarter way to do it than a Washington mandate, one size fits all, that could have unintended consequences. So the question is, what's the right way to help women? We're told that having a national mandate will keep more women in the workforce, but that's not been the case necessarily in the states that already have this. In California, for example, um, uh, they saw, like New York and New Jersey, a dip in women participating in the workforce in all the states with the paid uh, mandatory paid medical leave has lower labor participation today uh, than they did when they began the program. Texas, for example, while it doesn't have this mandate, has more women, a higher labor participation rate for women than California, for example. In a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research on California said, look, here's the good news. Uh, women are able to spend more time with their children. We think that's really important. But there are other consequences, too. Uh, it reduced employment of women by 7 percent, reduced wages by 8 uh, percent, reduced uh, the number of children born, and slowed the pace of women's trajectory in their careers. Those are troubling consequences I think we can all agree we want to avoid. So a good, thoughtful discussion how, how best to achieve all of these goals, I think is the right approach. Secondly, we're told we need to be like Europe. We need to be like the OECD, but you know the facts there aren't so good either. Uh, the study by the respect economist Isabel Soto using Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that women in the workforce, the truth is America has a higher rate without a mandated, rather a voluntary medical leave uh, program for workers that is better than much of Europe. And when you look at female managers, America, again, without a European style mandate on this, has a much higher percentage of female managers than much of Europe does. In fact, all of those Europe region does. So the point here, I think, is that we believe there is a smarter way of delivering this important um, benefit to workers across America. We think having a bipartisan approach on this is much smarter and we think can be more helpful to women, the workforce, the families and our economic growth than this one size fits all mandate. But the ANI urge support uh, of the amendment being offered. I yield back. Thank you, the gentlemen. The gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to my colleagues uh, for this debate on this amendment, I would like to speak in opposition. Uh, the ranking member just talked about the labor force and what is really driving uh, workers out of the labor force right now, especially women uh, who typically shoulder the majority of family caregiving responsibility is the lack of access to paid leave. As I said earlier in my uh, opening comments about my constituent, Tamika Henry, Voluntary doesn't mean compensated, right? And so that means they're shouldering the burden to care for the loved one on top of uh, not being compensated. That hurts their future ability uh, in Social Security and the retirement benefits uh, and, other benef uh, and, uh, and other issues that address uh, inequities. Women with minor children of any age are significantly less likely to be working than men. Now, what I really wanted to point out, though, is right now in America, one in five workers has access to employer-provided paid family and medical leave, and these workers are disproportionately higher paid and working for larger businesses. According to the Joint Committee on Taxation, 33% of workers in the highest income quintile get paid family leave from their employers, but only 8% of those in the lowest quintile do. So why are you pitting one group of wage earners 
who are trying to have the opportunity to take paid leave for their families against those in the higher income who get it. Why is it so bad for low income people to have access to it, but good for higher income people to receive it? And specifically to this amendment, I know that our committee worked hard to address a number of issues. Specifically, it is better to use the most recent quarter data for uh, verification of work. And that's what our uh, a bill does. It reduces errors, it prevents delays in getting benefits to the people who need it. That's what we did to make this bill, the underlying bill better. Your amendment goes against that. And I just wanna say in closing, Mr. Chairman, you know, these national talking points that are being used about um, socialism and tax and spend uh, Democrats and, and a bloated uh, uh, bill that's going to somehow take away the opportunity for Americans to succeed, our bill does the opposite. We're helping those Americans who need the help the most. Why is it okay for the highest income earners and the biggest businesses to have this benefit and not lower income workers and small businesses to have that benefit? We're leveling the playing field and addressing those inequities, not widening them and not creating more wedges uh, between Americans. We're trying to build back better in a more equitable and inclusive way. Thank the gentleman. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Smucker. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I'm trying to figure out, how, I'm sorry, Mr. Estes, Mr. Estes is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to yield my time to, uh, to uh, Mr. Smucker to, to uh, answer a couple questions. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Estes for yielding. I just wanted to uh, uh, respond to two points that have been brought up. First, there, my amendment does not include any income measures, uh, high income, low income. It simply uh, states that an individual who receives the benefit uh, should have been working uh, or should be working at the time uh, that they or take the leave. And then secondly, some states' policies were brought up. And what I want to say is that if you support the states' policies, if you support this policy, pointing out that the work requirement measures in this are far more generous than California or any other state, and this would bring it into line with those. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman, uh, the chair once again is prepared to call the question. Members uh, are reminded to unmute themselves for the voice vote. All those in favor of the gentleman's amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. 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 Opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The gentleman from Pennsylvania has requested the yeas and nays, and the clerk will call the roll. The remote members are reminded to mute. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? What? Hey, Mr. Blumenauer? Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascarell? Mr. Pascrell? Mr. Davis? Davis, no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Mr. Higgins? Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Del Bene? Del Bene votes no. Ms. Del Bene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Kildee votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. 
Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? one of the fastest growing sources of emissions. Mr. Evans? Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? No. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? Panetta, no. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez, no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Horsford votes no. Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes nay. Ms. Plaskett votes nay. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunes? Nunes votes aye. Mr. Nunes votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith of Nebraska votes yes. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes yes. Mr. Reed? Reed is aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? Yes. Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Aye. Mr. LaHood votes aye. Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Sorry. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Mr. Evans? Evans votes no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Is the clerk prepared to, to offer the tally? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have 25 nays and 18 ayes. There being 25 nays and 18 ayes, the amendment fails. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Winstrup, Mr. Dr. Winstrup. I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman has an amendment at the desk. Mr. Thompson is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson.